Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with us and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. Before we get to the show, I just want to mention a few things. Initial Ascent Packs, they're awesome. I used a 2K all last season. I'm still using it now for stuff. Uh, I'm going to be using it for uh, training, for uh, prepping for my hunt and getting some miles in with some, uh, some weight on my back. And I uh, just recently picked up a 6K, and it's going to be awesome as well. Plan on using it on my elk hunt along with the 2K if I'm doing some day hunts or something and having a base camp. But uh, if I'm packing on my back and going in there, depending on where I'm at, I'm going to be using that 6K. Uh, Dennis and Joe are amazing people. What's awesome about that company is you can reach out to them, and they're the ones who are going to answer your call and actually talk to you about their product. And you're going to even get a handwritten note from them thanking you for your purchase and uh, wishing you luck on that hunt. And I just find that is super awesome and amazing in this day and age to have somebody that does that for you and uh, actually hand writes a note for you is just amazing and uh, on top of that it's an american-made product and one thing about this podcast is and myself is just that anything that's american-made that i can support or get behind and it's a quality product i'm going to talk about it this is not a paid promotion i'm honestly just talking to you about an amazing pack so uh check them out if, if you don't have one or you're looking for a pack give, give them a try uh you'll like it for sure and then on top of that, we're going to talk about TreelineAcademy.net. TreelineAcademy.net is the most comprehensive e-scouting course ever, ever made. Mark Livesey is just an amazing, amazing wealth of knowledge, and he's willing to share that with everybody. So uh, check that out and see what's going on there with that. Use promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20% on sign up. It's awesome. And uh, actually, it's not 20%. It's 20 bucks. Save yourself $20 off of sign up. Then the next one I want to talk about is Basemap. Basemap app with their hunt data, the the online mapping system for e-scouting, setting waypoints, smart markers. Uh, so you have all your hunt data on the wind and anything, as long as you have a cell signal. It's absolutely amazing. There's so much more that's coming out. They've updated their offline maps, so they're way, way, way faster than they used to be, which I know a lot of people were actually kind of complaining about that, but now they're lightning fast. I've downloaded them, used them. It's awesome. On top of that, they've got some new updates that are coming out that are just going to blow you away. Can't talk about them yet, but we will be talking about them. So check them out. Use promo code pc 25 Save yourself 25% on sign up, only on the website, not on the app. And with that being said, let's get to our show. All right, so I'm sitting here and I'm talking to Jonathan Bohm. And uh, Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit? All right, so where do I start? I got into hunting about 11 years ago, it was 2010. Yeah, about 2010s when I started getting into hunting, started taking a camera in the woods with me and filmed a little bit here and there, made a few videos and, and kind of took off with that as a hobby, like a side hobby. Started filming my hunts and, and po posting them up on YouTube and uh, got to killing a few critters and learning more, learning more and more over the years, built up a little bit of a following and uh, I'm still learning more every year. So uh yeah, that's where I'm at now. I've I've got to the point where I've made a business out of it, and I'm still loving it. C carrying a camera in the woods <laughs> everywhere I go, it's it's a kind of a chore, but if you know if you love doing it, it's uh, it's enjoyable. I like to go back and watch watch my hunts. So no, that's pretty that's cool. kind of my thing. Um, so I got to ask you because the name of your channel is Catman Outdoors on your YouTube yep. channel. Um. I'm guessing you didn't get that nickname or a name for your channel from hunting. So no, <laughs> unless you're actually, hunting big cats. well, I wasn't even hunting when I come up with that name. It was, I was probably 12 years old. I had just got into fishing and started catching some channel cats down in the Creek. And I got online reading on some forums and stuff, uh, reading up on cat fishing a little bit. And, uh, I noticed, uh, you know, cat fishermen refer were referring to each other as cat men. So I, I started using that as my 
username online whenever I made an account or, or something. I, I just went by Catman and or Catman529, which is my birthday. So uh, it just kind of stuck. And when I eventually got into filming and hunting and stuff, uh, I just went with Catman Outdoors because that's kind of it just stuck <laughs> ever since I was 12. No, that's pretty cool. So um, what do you think the bulk of your like content on your channel is? Is it more so um, hunting stuff? I mean, I know you do a lot of like uh, turkey hunting and deer hunting as well. Actually, quite a few deer in one year but um that's the main that's probably the bulk of it but then if it's not deer turkey season i'm doing a little bit of whatever uh, mainly fishing but i'll do a little bit of other stuff i've got videos on like bug spray for ticks and and stuff just random stuff like that that you know that pertains to hunting or fishing but um uh, yeah m mostly this time of year i've been doing a lot a lot more fishing but I'd say deer season is kind of the number one thing and followed very closely by turkey season, which in my mind, it should be the other way around. But viewer wise, the deer hunting is number one. Nice. So um, I asked you on and we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I wanted to talk about river fishing for catfish and uh, kind of getting the lowdown on that and see how you do it down there in Tennessee versus what we do here in Illinois and uh, kind of get some pointers from you. And uh, you have oh, catfish up there. Oh, we do have catfish up here. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few of them. Um, I'm just messing with you. Yeah. So um, just kind of curious to see, um, you know, how you do it. So I'm kind of going to just ask you, man, um, what's your favorite way for catfishing? Is it, you know, pole or like, uh, bank poles or, or jugging or what it depends on what i'm going for if i'm trying to catch a big one i'll use my rod and reel set up to fish off the boat you, you can fish offshore in a lot of places but i've got a boat so i take it uh if i'm looking for eating size fish i'll throw a bunch of jugs but you can catch little fish on the big rods and you can catch big fish on the jugs too but normally that's how i do it so when you use jugs, are you actually using like, you know, old, old plastic jugs like milk jugs or, or bleach bottles or something like that? Or, or how do you do it? No, I used to, I used to use, uh, what was it, Gatorade bottles. And then I kind of switched over to noodles and I kind of got away from it for a little while and have just kind of got back into it this year with with using the noodles or with uh with yeah with just jugs or noodles in general i switched over to limb lines for a while and then i caught a pretty good flathead several years ago on a limb line and i said well i'd rather reel this thing in so i kind of went to rod and reel for a while and now this year i've been doing both okay i'll throw some jug i'll throw some jugs out take the boat somewhere else uh like say I, if i'm throwing jugs on a river i'll run downstream a, a mile or two and drop anchor or drift fish with the rods and then wait for the jugs to catch up and then go check my jugs. So I can kind of two, kill two birds with one stone if I want to. So let's kind of break, break that down then with the noodles. So you're talking like pool noodles with, uh, like how, how do you set them up? Is it like, and I mean, the other thing is, is how do you see them? Cause like I always painted my jugs like a bright color with like an orange spray paint or something like that real bright. Um, what are you doing to one, set them up and get them because i mean a pool noodle is not too rigid by itself are you doing anything special to them or are you just putting like line around them or what do you what are you doing i used to i've got a, i've still got a few that i made a few years ago where i just tied the line around around the noodle which that'll work but um this past spring my girlfriend got me into back into jugging and she set hers up with the uh pvc pipe and a little eye bolt on the end so you can loop your line through that eye bolt and set them at different depths but uh other than that it doesn't really matter how you hook it up the pvc setup is a little nicer and you just glue a piece of pvc pipe in inside the noodle and have a little bit sticking out one end uh as far as visibility and i've always done this whether it was a jug or a noodle I take one or two pieces of blaze orange duct tape, wrap it around, and then take a strip of reflective tape, which ha that's kind of expensive tape. It's like three or four bucks for a 30 inch roll. <laughs> but you take a piece of reflective tape. I use white 
but you can use the trailer tape that's white and red or whatever. It doesn't matter. You put a piece of reflective tape all the way around. So during the daytime, you got that blaze orange so you can see it. And at nighttime, you hit it with a light and it just glows. Nice. So I, I'm kind of curious. So you said uh, an eye bolt in the end, like you put it, like you drill a hole through the PVC through the side or something like that. And then you put the eye bolt through it and put a nut on it, nut and washer or something to hold it in place. Now they're self-tapping. You just drill a hole that's a little bit smaller and just screw it in and it stays. Okay. And then and it's really the only, the only purpose that serves is to adjust the depth. Say I've got, I've got 10 foot lines on my jugs. And if I want to fish them five foot deep, I'll leave five foot wrapped around the noodle and then just kind of loop it through a couple of times. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain how you loop it through, but you loop it through the, the uh, eye bolt and then flip it over the bolt and pull it tight. And so you can fish it as deep as you want. So kind of like a cleat, like a cleat on a boat kind of where, where you yeah. loop it through and then go around, except you're doing it on the, on the eye bolt then. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of, kind of like a cleat. Yeah. Okay. You just, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. That uh, makes that's, sense. That's the only reason. That, yeah. No, that's pretty good. It though. works pretty well. So did you find that the, there's more buoyancy or resistance when the fish first takes the hook on the, on the noodle versus like a jug? You know, it just seems like a noodle has more uh, resistance and float to it. And then if you got PVC inside of it, it's probably got a little more weight to it. Um, I don't really don't know the difference. I would think a bleach bottle would have a lot more resistance because it's a lot bigger and it's nothing but air inside. But the the noodles work, they work great. Um, I, the only jugs I ever used back when I did use jugs was little Gatorade bottles, like the 20 ounce. Mm-hmm. So that's about the same same diameter as a noodle so that's not going to really be much different okay and and that's been years since i've used a an actual jug i I switched to noodles several years ago and then got out of it for a while got into limb lines got into rod and reel and uh went back to noodles noodles are great because you can poke a hole in the jugs on accident you know they get beat up you could accidentally run a hook into it or something or catfish drags it around in the rocks and they they can take on water, but a noodle doesn't take on water. So they're a lot tougher. So um, what kind of hooks are you using and how many hooks do you use on your line when you're, when you're doing that? Just one hook at the end of it or just one hooks. And sometimes this anchor, um, I use kale hooks, like three odd or four odd kale hooks. Uh, a little bit smaller hook, but I'm trying to catch eating size catfish, put a smaller piece of bait on. It's funny. I caught a 20 pound blue a couple of nights ago on a jug and it was a little bitty hook, but it hooked them good on a little piece of a, no, it was on a bluegill head. It wasn't even a little, it was a pretty big bait. It was a whole bluegill head, but normally I'll catch, you know, two to three, five, six, seven pound catfish on the jugs, but there's no telling. I mean, you got a piece of fresh cut bait in the water. There's no telling what may eat it. Yeah. So is that like your preferred bait then is using like cut bait, stuff like that? or Cut bait, cut bait for sure. Yeah. Maybe bluegill, maybe skipjack. Could be whatever I can get my hands on. Could be bass or crappie, um, sucker, creek chub, stone rollers. Um, it could, it, I mean, it could be anything. Carp, um, if, you, if you want a lot of bait quick and you got some sweet corn and you get into a bunch of common carp, throw out some sweet corn on a number two bait holder and just sit and wait for one to take it. They fight like a freight train. You get a <laughs> five, t- five, 10 pound carp. That's a lot of cut bait. Nice. <laughs> that's pretty it good. It works good too. <laughs> so when you're, uh, when you're doing these jugs, um, I mean, how far of a stretch of river, I mean, are you putting them in and letting them go, you know, like two miles or are you letting them go, you know, like a couple hundred yards? normally i fish i try to fish them in lakes where i don't gotta chase them way down river but the other night we did put them out on the river and they were generating below the dam so they they come down the river quicker than i expected but first one to come by had a six seven pound blue cat on it and we let him get by and then pulled the lines up and um went on down chased them down and pulled them all i only threw 10 out and then the next one that had a fish on it had that 20 i didn't weigh it it was at least 20 it could have been a little more had that big blue on it nice nice so i'm just so it kind of it depends on the current and, yeah. and like i said I'll, I'll throw them and go down river and then fish 
and just wait for them to catch up. Well, I went about a mile down river and they caught up in like 10 minutes. So I didn't go far enough down river yeah. and there's a lot of current there was, they were still running generators that night. So there was a lot of current. They were moving pretty quick, but the fish were biting. Nice. Yeah. I was kind of thought about that. Like how long, you know, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter, but you know, if you got to, if you want it to go longer, if you put a weight in it, so it like weights it along the current, but, um, well, if it, that weight won't do anything, if it's not touching bottom. So you get, so you got a 10 foot of line on a jug and you throw it out in the middle of the river or off to the side. I try to throw them a little bit off to the side. So the barges don't run them over, but those river bank, those river banks drop off pretty quick. And if they get in a 10 foot or so, they'll eventually get hung up and stay there. But if they're in deeper water, they'll just keep going with the current. So you don't ever let your, uh, your, your bait or your hook touch touch the bottom then you want it off bottom it will it, it's okay if it touches bottom i try to kind of space them out and see where the fish are at really so so I'm, if it does okay. say say if you're fishing on a lake and there's no current but there's wind you put them on the upwind side of where you kind of want them to go where you want the wind to blow them and eventually it's going to blow some of them up into shore somewhere and they'll get and they'll stop there wherever the sinker hits the bottom and and sometimes that's where you catch a fish, but sometimes you catch a fish suspended out in the middle of the lake. You just, you know, that's why, that's why it's good to kind of spread them out and figure out where the fish are. Okay. No, that's good to know. Cause I always wondered, I, I put weights on them, but I'm like, man, I don't know. You know, if you don't know the full depth or where it's going, like sometimes I'll throw them in and, and I'll throw them in and, uh, way deeper water and it gets shallower towards where I'm kind of sitting on the bank waiting for them to show up. But, uh never had a whole lot of luck on them so maybe i'll have to try cut bait i've thrown chicken livers and stuff like that on them and i don't know if it's because it just chicken liver needs to get sit you know like i've had luck with the chicken livers it's good fresh throwing. chicken liver is good it's good for eating size channel cats and and honestly uh i haven't used it in years because chicken breast probably works just as good for eating size catfish and it stays on the hook way better it's a lot less messy a lot more expensive and pretty much yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, but you get the cheapest chicken breast you can find. You get one whole chicken breast, cut it into a bunch of little strips. You can get a good amount of bait out of it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's you and it'll about. stay. You don't have to worry about it flying off the hook when you throw it. Yeah, that's true. That's that's good uh, information there. So um, I'm kind of curious, though, like, why did you switch from, from the jug and just because you wanted to reel them in and feel that fight versus, uh, yeah, I like, I like having, uh, having lines in the water, watch my rod bend over and pull back on a big one. And plus, you know, with limb lines, you can catch or jugs, you can catch a big fish, but then when I'm running rod and reel, I can anchor my boat on the channel, drop off and put my baits right on the bottom, or I can drift with them either. Or I just, I like fighting a fish rather than just picking it up, you know? Like, like I said, I, I prefer jugs for catching eating size fish. Yeah. I'd rather catch a big one on rod and reel. So when, uh, they're fun to fight. when you're, when you're taking them and eating them, what, what size is like a perfect eater? Three pounds, two to four pounds. So you, and that's preference. A lot of people will eat the big ones. Just cut them, cut them up into chunks. I mean, I've heard of people eating 60 pound flatheads and I'd, I'm sure that it tastes just as good, but the texture is different. You got a much thicker grain, tougher meat on a big, big flathead or big blue cat than you do on a two to four pounder. The little ones are more flaky, and I, that's personally how I like them. So it's just a preference thing. I got you. Also, the the big ones lay a lot more eggs than the little ones, so it's good to let them go to to keep the population going. So, but I don't have anything against keeping a big one here and there. I just prefer the little ones for for eating yeah so when uh you're cleaning them what's like the preferred method to actually clean the fish you know getting through that tough tough skin sharp fillet knife <laughs> make sure that knife's sharp get it sharpened up uh i'll go right behind the head go around the dorsal fin you know just fillet it like normal and then i'll lay it skin side down on a cut board and take that fillet knife and skin it out and just get a skinless fillet and if it's a bigger fish say i take home a seven eight nine pounder 
then they almost always get cut up into nuggets. But if it's a small, like two, three pound catfish, then I'll usually fl- fry the whole fillets. So, um, do you ever have to worry about like the fat on them or, or, uh, how do you, cause I know like I've eaten some catfish before where it did not taste good. You know, it had a like real muddy, like muddy taste. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've had it. To I think that has amazing. to do. I think that has something to do with the blue green algae or something in the water. I, I remember reading that blue green algae makes fish taste muddy, but I don't know for sure. I've had catfish that taste pretty muddy and t- catfish that taste really clean. A fish out of my pond, it's a spring fed pond, but it looks kind of muddy during the summer, but everything I've eaten out of there was real clean tasting. But uh, I don't mind a little bit of muddy taste in catfish. If it's got dark red meat, cut that out. That's the only thing I would do. Cut out the dark meat, like the red, the mud vein, or they call it. Okay. Like if you got any kind of dark red in them, and that goes for a lot of fish, that dark red meat's got a strong taste. I'll go ahead and cut that out and try to keep it mostly white meat. Blue cats are, are particularly white meat. They're, they're uh, some of the best, like a three, four pound blue cats, a really good eating fish, but flatheads, blues channels, they're all good eating. Nice. Nice. So, um, <clears throat> how do how are you cooking them up? Do you always frying them or you do anything different or most of the time? Yeah. Deep fried in uh Louisiana, uh, fish breading in the blue bag. Um, but I'll occasionally grill them with black and seasoning or just blacken them in a skillet. Uh, black and fish is my second favorite way to cook fish, uh, after deep frying, but normally with catfish, especially I like them best deep fried. So kind of curious if you could only fish one fish, uh, for the rest of your life and go after one species, what would it be? I would die. (laughs) <laughs> I like catching so many different kinds of fish. <laughs> that's like saying that's like saying deer or turkey. I would say turkey, but then you got four months of deer hunting where you're not deer hunting. You know, if I had to choose one, I'd it wouldn't happen. Just shoot, just shoot me. <laughs> um, if I had to, though, let's say theoretically, if I had to, um, I don't know because if fishing for catfish, there's a there's a catch there. I've got to get bait. So then I'm fishing for another fish. Okay. That's fair. Um, Walleye is the best eating fish in freshwater I've ever eaten, but they're really hard to catch. But, um, uh, that would be a good one to devote all my time to. Cause then maybe I'd get good at catching them, but they don't fight good. They, you just catch them to eat. Yeah. Um, smallmouth bass is near the top of the list. Smallmouth bass, catfish, common carp, I don't eat carp, but I like uh, I like catching them for fun because they fight. They're one of the hardest fighting fish I've caught. Um, large mouth is fun. I don't get too excited about them, but they're pretty much everywhere and they're fun to catch. They're not too hard to catch, so I like that. But I I wouldn't just fish for large mouth. It would small mouth would be a good one. Um, I don't know. I can't I can't decide. So I just if I had to fish for one fish. Recently, my new thing that i've been been doing is uh fly fishing for smallmouth yeah and that is something that just took it to a whole new level of fun and excitement and i mean it was like you know what it's like find finding new joy in a hobby that you once had you know like restoring that joy and and, uh you know instead of just a thousand casts it's it's pretty cool to try and do that even though i'm not very good at the whole fly fishing thing Oh. Yeah, I've got a fly rod. I've actually got a fly tying jig sitting over there. Um, in the past, a few years back, I tied a couple of crawfish flies using, I forget what all I used. I used some chenille, I think, for the body, and then I used a uh, squirrel tail for the claws. And uh, I gave one to a buddy of mine who was into fly fishing a little bit at the time, and he said it worked good. Um, fly fishing for carp you like smallmouth try sight fishing for common carp with a fly use a little nymph for a little crawfish imitation you got to get it right in front of their face and make it look like a little bug scooting across the bottom it's (laughs) really tough but hook into it you better have a pretty stiff like seven eight eight, or nine fly rod (laughs) yeah no kidding those things they'll they'll put a smallmouth to shame partly because they get a lot bigger but they're one of the best fighting fish if you like fly fishing it, that's a good challenge. Just try catching common carp. I've uh, 
I've been told that from another a guy that actually guides for fly fishing on the river, and he was telling me mm-hmm. he's like, you know, it's only a certain time of year when you see the certain you know little nymphs on the water or something like that, and you can actually start seeing yeah. carp. And he's like, I'll throw the anchor and ask people, hey, you want to have a good fight? You know, we'll we'll start throwing some stuff at them and see if we can catch them. But I've never had that opportunity yet. Normally, the only time I'm going after carp is bow fishing. But yeah. Well, if you get them up in shallow water where they're feeding, where you'd be shooting them with a bow, if you can see them feeding, then you can it, you can put a fly in front of one and talk about a fight. I haven't caught one in a fly rod in years. I kind of got away from fly fishing, but I've I've still got all the stuff. I just kind of got away from it for a while. But uh, it used to be a little tournament here locally several years back, uh, like an online carp fly fishing tournament where you take pictures of it on the ruler and everything. But uh, I did that once or twice, and I didn't do very good, but I caught a couple, and it was pretty fun. It was a good challenge. <laughs> That'd be pretty the worst, cool. The worst thing that happened, worst thing that happened, this is probably eight or nine years ago. Worst thing that happened, I was on the boat up in a little tributary creek, and there was a probably 20-pound grass carp eating cottonwood leaves off the surface of the water. And I had tied a fly. Well, I say tied, but I pretty much just took a uh, – piece of you know that craft foam that you can cut out and stuff that comes in a sheet like paper but it's like foam Mm -hmm. it comes in different colors i took some green craft foam and cut the shape of a leaf and i tied a little hook to it and uh i tied a a loop knot so that the leaf wouldn't twist my my leader yeah and so i had i had just a loop on the end of the line through the eye of the hook well, I didn't use a good quality hook. I just used a bait holder and I didn't know there was a little gap in the eye, oh, like the no. slightest little gap. <laughs> well, I put it in front of this feeding grass carp. It's probably at least 20 pound grass carp. He comes up and eats it. I set the hook and just pop that loop right out of the hook. Didn't even break the line. Just came back with an empty loop of line. Spooked the fish, of course. He felt it. <laughs> I, I almost caught a 20 pound grass carp on a piece of foam. <laughs> That's been that's been eight or nine years ago, and that still bothers me. <laughs> that's pretty awesome, though. That's pretty yeah. uh, pretty cool that it almost happened anyway. If you ever hook into a grass carp, uh, that's like that's like a common carp on some kind of drug. When they see you, they don't always fight right away, but when they see you and they know what's up, they take off like a torpedo, and you're sl- you're not slowing them down until they decide to stop running. That's kind of how it is when you're bow fishing, but I've never, so how do you say you're using regular tackle? How how do you go about trying to catch a grass carp? I mean, do you got to use like super ultra light line or what? No, uh, try to use heavy line if I can. Um, cause they'll carp, especially commons. will get you up into snags. they will go straight for a blow down tree or something. Grass carp, not so much. They pretty much just run out for the middle. Um, on like wild grass carp, ones that you find in rivers and lakes, it, it can be tough. Um, and if you go to, say, neighborhood ponds or city parks where people feed the ducks, you catch, uh, catch grass carp on white bread, and they love it. Really? Cause I've if they're never, used to eating it. I always thought that the grass carp actually just ate, like, vegetation, like grass or something. Yeah. I mean, they is, do. That, is that what And bread... <laughs> I mean, bread is, is a grain. It's technically, <laughs> it's, it's vegetarian. So they, they, and if they're used to being fed, say, let's say you're at a city park and they stocked like way too many grass carp, which they usually do subdivisions. Like uh, one of the best ponds of fish is in an apartment complex and they put too many carp, too many grass carp in and they eat all the weeds. They don't have anything to eat except bread that people are feeding the ducks so you go out there and tear up a couple slices of bread into pieces, throw it out there to chum them, and then take a – this is where I use light line, like six-pound test. Take a number two bait holder, pinch a piece of white bread on the shank, but leave the rest of it fluffy. And you need that light line to actually cast – get any casting distance because if you don't use any weight, I fish in top water when the grass carp <laughs> start eating that bread off the top. So you basically – and sometimes you'll have ducks and geese get in the way, and you have to be careful. You'll catch a goose if you're not careful – so you you watch what's feeding on your bait but uh you get those grass carp feeding on the top and you pick one see kind of which way he's going kind of figure out which way he's working his way and chunk your bait out ahead of him if you throw it too close to him it spooks him real spooky fish 
get it out ahead of them and hope they find it and just let it sit there on the surface. If it sinks, you'll catch them off the bottom too. But let it sit there on the surface. You watch them slurp that thing in. Once you can't see that bread anymore, that's hold pretty, on. Set the hook and cool. hold on. <laughs> it kind of and makes I always me... let them go. I yeah. always let them go because they, they stock them in there for a reason. They paid money for those fish. I put three in my pond six years ago, and at least one of them is still alive. They were about 10 inches long when I bought them, and they were 12 bucks a piece. And the last one I saw was 25, 30 pounds six years later. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that uh, definitely cooler than, I mean, you get get more opportunities to catch them than, than uh, shooting them with the bow. But, you know, yeah. that, that that's kind of cool that you can do that. I, I'm going to have to go try that now because I've, I've never it's actually fun. tried fishing for carp. You ever fish them at night? Oh, yeah. I've caught some good ones at night. I think early morning, evening, and then nighttime is the best time. You'll have times of day when they're not feeding. They won't bite. Like if you ever see a bunch of common carp or buffalo, buffalo are finicky anyways, but if you say you see a bunch of common carp sitting out there just below the surface not doing anything, or say they're just swimming around below the surface not really feeding, if they're not actively feeding, they're not going to bite a bait. They just they turn on and they turn off. Hmm. If you see... If you see bubbles coming up off the bottom and you see tails kicking and big clouds of mud in the water and you know they're feeding, throw out some sweet corn for the common carp and uh, I guess white bread for grass carp. That's interesting. I've always heard I've always heard mulberry trees are good. I have yet to find one hanging over the water where I could actually fish it. But if you got mulberry trees, they're starting to ripen right now. Yep. I got one on my pond, a little one on my pond, but the birds keep eating them supposedly when the ripe berries start dropping in the water, it can be really good carp fishing. So would you, so you're going to try and fish with the berry then put a berry on the hook or. If I ever find a tree that's dropping in the water. <clears throat> yeah, I would, I would go, I would go pick some berries and just drop, put it on a little bait holder and drop it in and see if I caught anything. I haven't had a chance to do it yet. That's interesting. That. Now I'm <laughs> trying to think in my head of different spots I got that might have mulberry. But... Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> I see mulberry trees everywhere, but when when's the last time I saw one hanging over the water? I haven't. Because you got to keep. That's one of those things when you're on the water, you just got to keep an eye out. Yeah, you know? no, that's you awesome. Get, you get you get used to what a mulberry leaf looks like. So wait, let me check that tree see if it's got anything. I just haven't found any yet. Yeah. So um, you've been doing some foraging for a while and you and i were talking a little bit earlier before we got started mm-hmm. with the recording and uh you happen to man- m- mention chanterelle mushrooms and uh yeah. i don't have any luck ever finding them and maybe i'm not looking right but i mean coming up here that's about the time of the year right june july when you start finding them yeah i just, I just saw a post on facebook today somebody found some in tennessee already so it's time to start looking here so when it gets hot and humid in the summer, you need some moisture. If it if it's going through a drought, you're not going to do very good. But it's during the hot and humid part of the summer. They just I don't really know what to look for specifically. I find them while I'm scouting for deer, running trail cameras, and just covering ground in the woods is when I find them, and just randomly be some chanterelles just sitting there. So it's not you like... can't miss them. They're like bright orange, so they're <laughs> easy to find if you do find them. But I'm just kind of curious, like, is, is it something that, um, have you ever put any thought to, like, maybe it's around certain types of trees or um, anything where they know. have, like, a mycorrhizal relationship with the, uh, you know, a certain I type of tree know. where they grow on the roots or anything, like a chicken or a hen of the woods, you know, you find them. I've never found hen of the woods. I oh, found man. chicken of the woods, uh, sulfur shelf, the bright orange one. I yep. found a bunch of that, but. Uh, and it seems to favor oak trees from what I could tell, but, uh, hand of the woods, I've never found it. I found chanterelles, but then, I mean, I can tell you they were in woods with oak, hickory, red maple, uh, maybe ash, maybe a little bit of ash. I don't remember finding them around a specific tree cause they were just kind of scattered out and there's, it's real heavy on the oaks in, in the woods where I found most of them, but that's just kind of how the woods are around here. There's a lot of oaks. Right. That's what I'll tell you for the uh, the hen of the woods is definitely if you find those big old mature like hundred year old oak trees and uh, especially mm-hmm. the black oaks 
you will uh oh yeah and where i found the most chanterelles last year there was a ton of black oak so go back in on the that fall. P- on that piece of property <laughs> go back in on the fall on property. those root on those roots on the root mass and you'll probably find yeah. some find oh, well, some head of the woods i know where to look i know where to look <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a black oak out there. Most of the trees, it's been logged in the past, and most of the trees are, you know, mature but not old, old, old. But there's one black oak up in there. It's not far from the road, and it's got a couple dead limbs, but it's still kicking. It's huge. That's where it's you're going to find them. <laughs> it's short and wide. It's, I don't know how wide the trunk is, but that's a big old tree. I, I may, I'll be in there this year for sure. Like, I, I, I've been thinking about scouting that area here in the next week or two. I'd say but, around um, September. August, end of August, Actually, September, start looking. Now that I think of it, I found chan- chanterelles right around that tree, or in, not under the tree, but in that exact piece of woods. I found some last year. That's, I didn't see yeah. hen of the woods. Is it is it a fall thing, like chicken of the woods? Hen of the woods is a fall thing, yeah. Um, is it, how's, chick- it taste in, how's it taste and texture compared to chicken of the woods? Completely different texture. That's what's crazy about really? mushrooms is uh, so many different mushrooms, like lion's mane. Um, which I regret. Now I found lion's mane. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Lion's mane or beard tooth, or is that the same thing? There's bear tooth and lion's mane. It's, it's very similar, but uh, they say that, and and I found one, and I I passed it up, and I can't believe I did, and I still kick myself today because I identified it, and I knew what it was, but I was like, man, I'm not sure. What if there's something else that's like it that's poisonous or something? Even though there's not really. Um, got back, identified it, never made it back there to go get it, but. They say it tastes mm. like crab meat. Kind of <laughs> interesting. I found a couple. Now, I don't know if it was beard tooth or lion's mane, but it's like the the shaggy, like it's only about this big usually. Yep. And it's just like kind of looks like real coarse white dog hair. Mm-hmm. All kind of yep. growing straight down. Yep. And that's. Uh, yeah, I found a couple of those and I always wanted to pick one and cook it. And then I never did. They, they it, say, if it tastes like crab meat then I'm, I'm all for it yeah they say it tastes like crab meat it's got a similar texture as well and uh you can actually mark that like on your gps app on your phone on your uh, base map or whatever and and go back and get it in like two weeks when it gets bigger or three weeks when it get, gets bigger because it'll actually get way bigger than that i mean it'll get the size of your head but um I mean, yeah. If I don't know if I've seen any that big. I've seen some bigger ones, but normally they're pretty small. Yeah. But uh, I mean, if I'd it say, was uh, like softball size, I'd pick it for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, chicken in the woods is good. Uh, you got to pick it when it's young. It gets pretty fibrous if you let it get too big, but it's kind of texture like chicken. Yep. That's and then uh, <laughs> I think chanterelles, chanterelles are my second favorite after morels, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're some of the better mushrooms that I've eaten, like uh, that I've picked. But I don't pick a lot of mushrooms. You got to go with the easy ones, you know, morels, chanterelles, chicken in the woods, a couple others that are easy. You know, when you get into the ones that have deadly lookalikes, I stay away from it. I want to be able to identify those, and I'm starting to get to the point where I can kind of pick them out. But I'm still too scared to take them and. Yeah, uh, you know, it'd but, be good. That's the kind of thing. It'd be good to have an actual mentor with you in the woods who really knows what they're looking for. Because yeah. you can only you can learn a lot on the internet, but but experience is really what where you yeah really can tell where you can tell just by looking at something what it is. And that's kind of how I got uh, with oak trees, and and I focus more on other stuff like that pertains to deer hunting or whatever. So I've gotten good with oak trees, but I haven't got into all the different mushrooms. I just stick to the easy mushrooms, the ones that you know for sure what it is. Oh, yeah. that's And what's crazy is, uh, I mean, they all kind of have their own unique taste and texture as well. And uh, mm-hmm. that's why I'm super, if I ever find one, I'm, I'm excited again <laughs> to take that lion's mane home. And, and there's really nothing like it. There's no, no lookalike. So don't be afraid to take it make sure yeah. once again just look at it and identify it in a book and go yep that's it and then uh, yeah there's nothing i've never seen a mushroom that looks quite like it yep it's, cut that puppy up unique. and eat it <laughs> well, i'm gonna do that next time i find one um another one i've i see everywhere i see it well into the winter time here is uh, oysters i've never tried oyster mushrooms are they good or have you ever tried i've them? never had them and found them but i've looked for them you never found them uh-uh if oh I they're everywhere them. down here if if I find them, I, I want them. That and uh, Bolitz is the next one I've kind of been keeping my eye on. But it's just there's so many. Um, uh, a friend of mine that's a forager gave me 
and it's Bolitz of Eastern North America, and the the author is Alan Bassett. And so I'm going to get that book because he says it's the most comprehensive book on Bolitz that there is. Because I've never even heard of those. So it's uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, it's got like a bigger cap and a and a thicker stem, and then on the bottom, it's actually a polypore, so it looks kind of like like tightly tightly uh, condensed together pores that look like a, almost like a sponge on the bottom side. Okay, yeah. And uh, some of them you cut them oh, open. Oh, I know what you're talking about. <clears throat> yeah, so they don't cut... have gills. They don't, they have, don't gills. have gills. They have the, bo- the pores. Okay. Yep. And so like uh, you cut them open and some of them turn blue. And the kind of the rule of thumb is if it like bruises blue when you cut it, it's poisonous. Even though that's not exactly true, that's a good rule of thumb to go by for somebody who's new to it until you really identify them all. But there's like hundreds of different varieties of beliefs. But I kind of yeah. want to get 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 into that because I, I see them all the time. I just don't know which ones. Well, here's here's the question. If you're looking at poisonous ones and, and having to see how it bruises and stuff, are they do they taste good enough to risk it? I th- I believe they do. <laughs> yeah, I because I've never heard of them or tried them, so I don't know. But yeah. I know with morels, morels are easy to identify. But even if they weren't, it'd be worth it because they taste that good. Yeah, no, I I hundred percent agree with you. I mean, morels are probably my favorite. My second favorite is hen of the woods. Although there's a lot of them out there that I've never tried, so I can't can't even make a decision on that one yet. But chanterelles, have you actually tried chanterelles, or are you? Still I've had I've had chanterelles. I don't find I don't find them really though, <laughs> unless somebody's given them yeah. to me or something. I don't, I don't ever really find them. They're, um, they're, they're probably my second favorite that I've tried. And then chicken of the woods is my third favorite. And I still haven't tried, haven't tried oyster yet. Haven't found hen of the woods. There's only really a couple others like lion's mane that I would feel comfortable trying. I've seen pheasant back, but I've heard it doesn't taste good. They're not bad, but you got to find them really small like yeah really small Um, seems really tough they they get super fibrous um yeah so when i take them but they say there's all kinds of medicinal benefits to them too that you can actually take them and and steep them in alcohol and make a tincture or you can um, Hmm. uh, make tea out of them and there's all kinds of benefits for like anti-cancer i mean like goes around cleans up cancer cells in your body and different things like that and it's good for your prostate and all kinds of stuff i mean there's so many things and compounds and mushrooms that people don't even know know about yet because i mean there's just so much of them but no that they're they're decent they're not i mean they're definitely not a morel mushroom but there's no, not a lot that compares to that i mean they got their own distinct beefy taste and and uh do you ever do you ever find uh like you get the half morels like half free yep yeah see a lot of people they always i was always told when i first started that you can't eat them that them are poisonous which is no you total bs them. i haven't found any yeah but, i've cooked them up i haven't found any in two or three years they're not very common around here but i have found them that's yeah but uh i mean people would always tell you oh yeah you can't eat those those you know they call them pecker heads or whatever and and uh, yep. you, you can't eat them. They ain't good for you, Yeah, you which can. is total BS. But I will say that, like, if you look at uh, the gyromitra mushroom, which is the only kind of lookalike that they call a fal- false morel. The false morel? I found a couple yep. of those that look like a brain, kind of. Yep. yep. They're, they're not hollow. You cut them in half, they're not hollow. Yeah. I've heard you can eat them. I've, like, some people eat those. Like, they're not really poisonous or something, but. I, don't I know. hear I, they it's are. It's not a morel. <laughs> some well, people heard, have died heard from some them. Some people. I think it's I've your heard tolerance. People get, um, yeah, I've heard people get an upset stomach, but some people eat them and don't have any issues. Yeah, I'm not going to chance it, and no. they don't look good, and they're not a morel, so I'm, no. I'm not going to fool. I'm not going to fool with them. <laughs> I wouldn't eat them. I wouldn't go for it. You might as well go for a morel if you can get them, especially. I mean, yeah. if it's that time of the year, and you're finding them anyway, for sure. But yeah, so I mean. So you don't really, when you're looking for the chanterelles, there's no rhyme or reason. You're just, you're scouting and setting up deer cams pretty much. Yeah. I pretty much just find them on accident and remember where I found them. 
you know, if they're real small, I'll let them grow a little bit. If I plan on being back in the area or like this year, I'll go back to same, some of the same areas I found them last year, just as a starting point to look for them. Nice. Kind of like what I do with morels, but yeah, I've, I've just stumbled into them a few times and they're good. Yeah. I, man, I cannot let the morels go because if I don't pick them, Somebody else is going to pick them. It's all on public. Is it that bad? Yeah, it's all on public ground, and it is some serious competition for those morels. <laughs> Man, I found – so we don't have uh, – we got people hunting morels around here. I got a lot of buddies that hunt them, but it's not a huge thing around here. Well, we probably don't have the numbers you do, but uh, there every now and again you'll get into a big patch. So I've got my best patch ever. I found it two years ago accidentally. I, I ducked off into a thicket and stumbled into all these giant yellows and it's been my little secret. Uh, <laughs> I've got t- two buddies that I trust who know where it's at. And uh, I picked a ton of them last year. And then this year I went in and they were just coming up, you know, like clusters of them only yep. about this big and they were all gray. They looked like the grays mm-hmm. before they matured and turned yellow. And there were just clusters of them popping up everywhere. So I left them for like a week or two left them for a week, came back and, um, uh, checked them and they were, they still had growing to do left them for another week or so came back by that time, Turkey season had opened or maybe it was the juvenile hunt. I came back to pick them, uh, with a buddy and so over the weekend when people were hunting, somebody found them and all the biggest ones were just stumps on the ground. <laughs> and, and this is in a place where people don't just go walk. It was in the thicket. Yeah. And I was, we still picked um, two or three dozen that they didn't find, but they were all like about that big, like, you know, four or five inch mushrooms. All the biggest ones got picked out. Nice. The whole clusters of them, the ones that I let grow for two yeah. weeks. That's why I don't the let big them grow. Clusters of them, <laughs> the, and some of those stumps were like inch and a half around and you could tell they had been massive. And somebody probably was just trying to set up on a turkey or something and probably found them the same way I did. Yeah, no, that a, I, that's too that much competition for me. That I can't let that. But go. that's not normal. That that's the first time I've had that happen. Or I found other. I found stumps and mushrooms once in a while here and there when I'm looking. Every now and again, I'll come across one that's been picked, but it's not normally a big competition here. I'll I'll be out there and have somebody come back behind me, follow me through, and pick up oh, the yeah. ones. Pick up the ones that I didn't. <laughs> it's, oh yeah, if you and if you turn around and go back the other way, you'll see a lot more you didn't see. Yeah, no, I'm saying people they just, come they, behind they, you and and actually follow you to pick. Oh, you mean people you don't know? Yes, people I don't oh, know. Oh, really? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's wow. how fierce the competition is. Sometimes you yeah, got to get there. That's early. pretty bad. I get up. I that's, get up early and I get out there first light and and start going after them. <laughs> that's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like that here, but then again. You could walk for hours here and not find any, or you could get out of the truck and go off in the woods to take a leak and accidentally find the best patch ever. They're like, they're real random around here. So what you're telling me is I need to come to Tennessee to find some, to come and get some morels. (laughs) You may, you may look for a while and not find anything. I've got buddies who've looked all over and haven't found any. And I've got buddies who were out hunting and just come into a huge patch of them. Like I have every now and again. Like a lot of my good spots are places I found accidentally over the years. And when it comes to finding new spots, I, I really don't find a lot of new spots that have more than a couple of them. You know, sometimes I'll find a couple here and there, especially around ash trees. I find like one or two around this ash tree, one or two around that ash tree. And then I'll go back every year and pick a handful of them. The big patches, they they're hard to come by. You may get lucky and just walk into a huge patch, but there's, they're not as widespread as they are in the Midwest mm. down here. And they're a lot more unpredictable. They like grow in all kinds of, all kinds of woods. Yeah. No, I found like, I never thought to look or knew they grew in pine trees until a few years ago. And started I haven't looking. found them in pines. I haven't found them yeah. in pines yet, but I found them in cedar, Eastern red cedar, cedar thickets. We got cedar glades here and privet Chinese privet thickets uh and you'll have a mix of cedar and privet or cedar and ash and i found them in those I, that's where i found some of the bigger yellows yeah is, is around cedar trees so that was pretty exciting when i found them in the pines so that's kind of been my thing is if i'm not finding them in one spot or you know it 
at my Asher elm trees, then I'm going to go and try and find them, uh, find them in the pines. And it seems like they come up, I don't know if that's true or not, but just kind of what I've noticed is they come up later in the pines. Maybe it's because of the shade that too much cover. Probably you know, the, but... It's probably the shade. Yeah. Like that spot that somebody found this year with all the big ones, that spot, it was in the shade, but it was right on the edge of, of the woods and it got a lot of sun like that particular spot warmed up quicker. And that was, that was a real early spot. They came up there before anywhere else. So yeah. I think it has to do, it's all has to do with temperature and in yeah. pines. It's going to be, it's going to be cooler in the pines. Yeah. So, um, I appreciate you coming on and talking. It's been good. And I feel like we could do this for, for, for a long time. Oh, yeah. Um, but, uh, I think that's a good point. We kind of covered a lot of stuff here and, uh, a good point to wrap it up, but before we go, can you kind of tell everybody where they can find all your content and find you and if they wanted to get a hold of you or whatever, where they can do that too? So my my main channel where you can go watch all my videos and stuff on YouTube is Catman Outdoors. I've got uh, Instagram, Catman529 on Instagram, Catman Outdoors on Facebook uh catman 529 outdoors on tiktok i think but i don't post on there a whole lot but i do have that as well and then my website catmanoutdoors.com i've got a couple recipes i've got an oak tree identification guide that's kind of my main thing that i've got going on there and then my merchandise also on my website so hats t-shirts and stuff i'm not wearing any of them right now (laughs) but i've got uh i've got some hats shirts decals uh Every now and again, I'll sell a batch of uh, wingbone turkey calls. That's my best seller uh, is the turkey calls, but I don't make many of them. But uh, that's where you'll find any. If you want to buy anything from me, it's going to be on campmanoutdoors.com, and you just click on store. Uh, if you're interested in oak trees or learning your acres and, and what, what to look for when you're deer, when you're deer hunting uh, October, whenever the acorns drop, uh, you'll go, uh, go on my website, click on Woodsman Corner. And it, it'll show you that the only thing I've got in there right now is the oak tree guide. So, and that's a work in progress. It's mostly done. It's got a whole lot of info in it now, but I'm, I'm still adding on to it. So that, other than that, that's pretty much where you can find me. It's Catman529 on Instagram, Catman Outdoors, pretty much everywhere else. All right. No, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for coming on and talking and sharing and uh, uh, talking mushrooms with me and, and uh yeah thanks for having me yeah it's been good appreciate it yes sir once again thank you so much for listening to the publicly challenged podcast i hope you enjoyed the show and if you did please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to also if you could leave a review that would help us out and you can check us out on instagram or at publiclychallenge.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show.